Hey, designers, today I have on a guest. I think you guys are going to love this. It's a little different than our usual fabric designer or any other kind of creative. Um, we have on Mitch Beinhacker. Beinha uh, you got it. Beinhacker's oh, right. He got it. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to have him here because he is an attorney and he has a great book which we're going to talk about today. I think will be really fun for us to chat about. And um, I'm just excited to have you on the show. Welcome, Thanks. Mitch. Thanks, Karina. I appreciate it. Okay. So first of all, I was over on Mitch's podcast. So you do have a podcast. Tell us why you started your podcast. Yeah. So the podcast is called The Accidental Entrepreneur, as you, I'm sure you'll say. And um, I've been doing about, we've been doing about five years, interviewed about 300 people, not all business owners, some of them, you know, working in the space, influencers, things like that. But as an attorney, I've been doing contract work and transactional work and whatever for more than 30 years. Constantly, I get small business owners that come to me and say, hey, I'm having trouble. I need to get out of this lease. I need to shut down my business. I need to do this and that. And I'm like, well, what does your business plan say? Can I take a look at your material? And they got nothing. So one day I was like, yeah, they're like accidental entrepreneurs. And that's kind of like where the name came from. And of course, everybody comes on the show and says, oh, this is written for me. I'm the accidental entrepreneur. I'm like, yeah, you and 300 other people. But it, I mean, it is, it's true. And that's kind of where it came from to share like your experiences, like we did on the show earlier, or other people's experiences and the mistakes you made and the things you learned along the way. And there are constant themes on the success side and on the failure side. So, you know, and I'm just trying to spread the good word about helping people to be successful. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur now. So we better step up our game. So here we are. That's my contribution to society. Oh, I love it. Well, so here's the deal. Don't you think that people say they, they feel like they're accidental entrepreneurs? Because I know on this, on this particular podcast, everyone doesn't say they want to be a business owner or an entrepreneur. They want to be a designer. Right. And so they're just trying to figure out ways to make money, not yeah. realizing that at the end of the day, they really are a business owner. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem, right? They're forced into it. If you want to create anything and you want to make it a living as opposed to having a job, and this is like a side hustle, you do have to learn some fundamentals. You don't have to have 20 people in your organization and build a big group. I, I did that and I walked away from it. I never want to do it again. Uh, but, you know, you can still have, let's call it a consultancy, you know, a freelance design uh, company. If you, you know, you should have a name for the company, whatever, where you can use some fundamentals, do some things in writing, actually write a business plan. I had a business plan challenge like during pandemic we did for like, it was five days write a business plan. We had different things you do each day. And at the end, you know, see, and only like two out of 50 finished, right? They were really very, very, it was not good. But I, I did get some people who are either solo practicing attorneys or they're designers like you and they have a solo practice or the consult. They were like, should I be doing this? I'm like, yeah, of course you should be doing this. And they did. And some of them did, you know, did well with it. Um, but we got to put things in writing. We got to, but have a little track to run on so we can go back to it. Because if you're creative, you got so much stuff running through your head. I got a lot of stuff running through my head and I'm not creative. So I can't imagine the ideas that are running through everybody's head in your world, right? They better take time and put it on paper. So when they go back, they don't have to try and reinvent the wheel. And that's a lot what the book's about. It's a lot what I talk about. I want people to start putting things in writing. Yeah. So let's, yeah. let's talk about this. And by the way, all of you designers who are listening to this and are like, I don't have something down on paper. This is a good reminder to like, maybe just write down some of the things you want to do. It doesn't have to be this crazy formal thing. Although Mitch probably has some expertise in that, but sometimes I think people think it needs to be like this MBA uh, business no. plan. Right. Does not one page. Yeah. And what's never, on that one page? What would like, what would you say would be on that page? You, you'd write down like, you know, this is my product. This is how I'm going to market it. It's like four parts. I actually have a template. It's not one page, but like four major parts, right? You have either your product or in this case, your service, right? But it might be a product too, your product or service, your people, right? We were talking about that in, on my show, right? You can't do everything yourself. So you can get virtual people. You get, they don't have to be on your payroll, whatever, but you, you can't, you got to get to the point where as you're growing, you can't do it all yourself. Like I do a certain amount of business. If I want to double what I'm doing, I can't do it myself. My fingers will be bleeding. I can't physically do that much work. So the people side of it is really important. 
And the, the marketing side of it's really important. How am I going to market this? How am I going to reach people? If people listen to my show, they'll hear your story as to how you kind of jump started and said, how do I get into an, I don't have an audience. How do I get in front of an audience? We had a very good conversation about it. And financials is probably the third part. You know, what's this going to cost me? How, you know, if I'm making a product, what's the cost of goods sold? Literally, do I need staff insurance? You know, things like, things like that. And uh, yeah. That would be the first place I'd start. And then you better get a contract for the things because everything you guys do is intellectual property, right? It's things that you create. You need to protect that. I get so many people call me and say, oh, you know, such and such just ripped off our website and they, they basically the same stuff. I go, yeah, but none of it's copyrighted. It's just like basic things. Good luck, you know? So you want to really protect. Uh, and there's less expensive ways to do it and the more expensive ways to do it. But you definitely want to protect your things. And you want to, if you have, somebody hires you to do work, I want to make it very clear in writing that th these are the limitations on what you're entitled to do with my work, that it's mine and you can do, you know, use it so many times and then you need my permission. You got to pay whatever. Yeah. So those of you, especially who've been asking, it's so funny because right now we're in the middle of this whole thing in Design Suite Mastermind, where we're talking about commercial licenses, yeah, which perfect. is a very interesting place to be. And like, how much, and should we make it unlimited? And should we put a number on it? And, you know, if someone takes this, what, what do they do with it? Um, the other thing that's so fascinating is I forget to tell people like, you need to have a terms of use yes. directly on in your website the and contract. Yeah. hundred percent. Look, when people go to uh what's one of the websites where you can buy photo stock photos and stuff. Oh, like Shutterstock. Yeah. And you go and you buy the photo. That doesn't mean you own the photo. There's fine print that says how many times you can reproduce it, what you can use it on, if it's on web, in print, whatever. And you violate those things. And I get designers that get letters from Getty Images and these other big companies that say, hey, you're violating your terms. Take it down or pay us 10 grand. Yeah. And, you know, it's scary, scary stuff. Yeah. So interesting. So let's talk about the book in terms of that. Sure. So the name of the book is 10 ways to get sued by anyone and everyone, yeah, which is a pretty scary title. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just, so I, my co-author Barry uh, has done some 10 ways books, like a series. So he said, if we're going to do something, it's got to be 10 ways to do something. I'm like, well, what, what's going to be 10 ways to write a contract? Like that's boring. So we came <laughs> up with this thing, how to stay out of court, because that's the problem, right? If you come to me and say, listen, having trouble with my business partner, having trouble with my landlord, having trouble with a customer. I'm, first thing I'm going to say as the kind of attorney that I am is what do you have in writing? Do you have an agreement with your landlord that they said you can do this? Do you, do, what's your customer agreement say? You know, what does your partnership agreement say? That is what lawsuits are made of. All the stuff that you said, he said, you wrote this tax, he misunderstood, forget about it. You'll be making the attorneys rich. So you want to make sure that you have those things in writing. And that's a major theme of the book. We go through all kinds of stuff from, you know, uh, business divorce, right? I talked to a divorce attorney, what happens, um, employment matters, insurance, but it, it all comes down to having things in writing, making it your habit to protect what you make especially as a, as a creative, right? And to, and to make it very clear to the people that you're doing business with, these are the terms and conditions. Yeah. Right? Because think, we're in commercial space. You gotta, there's no rules that they make it up for you. You gotta make up your own rules. Yeah, so for those of you, which most of you who are here, you're talking about design. I will tell you the places you're gonna want stuff is for sure a terms of use on your website. Mm -hmm. Okay, so however you're doing business. And then the second place is a terms of use within your products. So when you come out with, per, for example, a die cutting file, you're gonna want a terms of use with it. And, and, and a lot of it is just clarity, like this is for personal use and they're using it themselves, or this is for commercial use and you can use it up to 800 times in this manner, right? Uh, most of us don't want to be um, making products that someone can then take and then also resell digitally, right? That's yeah. really That'd very difficult. Right. Yeah, we don't want to do that. So um, I think this is a great conversation because even if you are just thinking about it, stop right. thinking about it and get it up. Yeah, because it'll be too late when, you, you know, if you're a photographer and they take your photos and now they're putting it on all their brochures and they're using it for the corporation on their websites and, and you didn't give them permission to do that. Or yeah. they're altering your design, which is worse, right? They take your design and they want to change it. And now it, I hate, I don't want to use the word, but bastardizes your work. It, it alters it and it's not. And then it, you know, and you, you're not a, only offended by it, but it could affect your reputation or, you know, all that stuff's really important, you know, really important. 
out of curiosity, and this is, I just, this came to me because I've been seeing this happen. I've been seeing Instagram posts about it, but we're seeing um, artists work uh, being taken in the United States and mm-hmm. taken from on foreign entities. Like, so China, we've seen yeah. a few, so, few of these where like they'll take a, a piece of art and then they'll put it all over a fabric. They start right. selling a product. They probably sell 10,000 of it. And the artist goes, just finds it. Like someone sent it to him, like, isn't this right. your piece of art? Yeah. What, like, what do you say to someone who's dealing with something like that? Because that's complicated. Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, it's it's hard to protect your, especially as a small company, right? If you're an international corporation, you may be filing trademarks and patents and copyrights all over the world. But if you're if you're a small designer, you're an artist, and your you know your your T-shirt or whatever your design ends up on a shirt in China, you're gonna have a little trouble doing anything about it. Now, if it ends up on the on the the rack at Neiman Marcus, you'll be sure you're sending them a cease and desist letter and tell them that you know this is my work and whatever. I, I actually was involved with a case. I don't litigate, but I was involved with a case um, a while back where it, I think it was it was either Neiman Marcus or Saks or something like that where this 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 artist his design ends up on the shirt and I think it was printed overseas. I'm not sure who did the printing, but I mean it was so intricate. There's no way. They were trying to claim like it wasn't stealing his work. I mean, the judge was like, come on, you got to be kidding me. So, right. So then they had a they had an order to stop selling it right there until this whole thing was litigated and decided. And in the middle of the case, somebody came into the court and said, your honor, I saw the T-shirt being sold again at Neiman Marcus last week. And the judge went nuts. And but it was very costly for the artist because he was dealing with a large company and they're fighting him on it and this and that. And it's it's hard to protect your stuff. But it's important that if you're let's say you're just starting out. Right. And to trademark your work uh, is is costly. It's like three hundred dollars a category, depending on where you're using it. You can copyright it with the Library of Congress online. It's less expensive. Used to be that you could do a whole volume of stuff, but now well, let's say it's 30 bucks for, so it's not that bad. But if you're putting things out there, like a logo or something like that, just put a TM next to it. If you ever see those little TM, that's a common law claim to a trademark. It's not a registered mark. A registered mark would be an R with a circle around it, which is a little bit hard to get, gives you certain statutory provisions, but at least you're telling the world, hey, this is mine. You should always put things, I even do it on the bottom of the podcast and stuff like that. Copyright, you know, Mitchell C. Beinhacker. 2018 to 2024 or whatever. So at least you have, you're making that claim and you have some protections when you, people say, well, I didn't know it was copyrighted. Well, you, it's been out there for, you know, five years. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for mentioning that too, because sometimes designers feel nervous to even put the TM. And very often we talk to our designers, we're like, throw that TM on there, just yep, throw it, it on there. And then that way, you know, for sure, like, I, you know, I've been using my same logo for 16 years now and we put, I put the TM on it from the very get go. And I'm like, at least you can see there is a blog post from 16 years ago that right, has right. this logo on it with the TM on it. And it's, it's sitting out there. So right. if someone tries to come and copy it now, I'm like, look, Very there's hard, like right. data sitting right. there. And copyrights and trademarks gain their strength from use. So the longer you've been using it, the more, you know, protection you get when it comes to that stuff. And it's, you know, look, it's important because look, take an industry that's not even legal in, in, on the federal level, like cannabis. I have a couple of companies that I represent and um, they want to, you know, they want to protect their name, the logo, whatever. Well, you can't file it in the federal registry because it's illegal. There's some states where you can file you know, for local stuff. It doesn't prevent you if you're operating in New Jersey, for example, right, where it's adult use is legal. I can't also sell in Pennsylvania. So if somebody uses the name in Alabama, I'm not going to be able to do much about it. But I can still put a TM by the name. There's nothing illegal about that. So, yeah, I mean, it's something that people, all creative, should learn about trademarks and copyrights and how to protect the work that they are, you know, have have the gift to create. Yeah, yeah. Amazing true with patterns or anything, you know, copyright. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, um, I would love to know, like, I just saw in your book at the, well, chapter two is like partners, like get it in writing with partners. Oh my God. Tell me about, I know, I bet you have stories. Like I would say, how do you feel about partnerships in general, actually? Yeah. I've never been successful with partnerships myself. Um, Not a lot of lawyers are, um, I think that one of the reasons is that there's a miscommunication, a misunderstanding between the partners. One's doing this, the other one's doing that. 
one's doing 80% of the work, it's 50, 50 split. So I think that's usually what happens with partnerships that it's not, you know, there, there's not a lot of understanding, but given the fact that partnerships very often run into trouble over time, right? You really want to have things very delineated and have it in writing what, you know, your operating agreement, what your responsibilities are, what this person's responsibilities are, what you're liable to do like when you can be personally liable and so forth. What happens if we want to break up? One of us dies, gets hurt in a car accident, can't work anymore, gets sued personally. How does that protect the business? Getting divorced. That's another like, in, you know, the spouse is like, well, I want half of your, your share of the business. And if you have it in writing, it says, listen, you can give him or her value for what you own, but they don't get to own shares in the business. So you want all that stuff. And I've seen, we've had cases over even small businesses. You know, let's take something in a creative space like um, uh, bakery, right? So they're making, they got picked. You know, so they, they not only have like recipes, which would be copyrighted and pots and pans and equipment. They also probably have all their pictures on Instagram, things like that. Yeah. So they're fighting over the littlest things as spoons and knives and photos and this and that. And, you know, and that's my recipe. No, it's how I made it, you know? So you really, it really can run into problems with partnerships and it just destroys your life. Like you want to move on and go start your new business and focus on that. You don't want to be spending 30, 40, $50,000 on a crappy lawsuit. That's not going to get you very far. Probably going to end you, end you up back in the same place you started just because, you know, you can't agree on anything. And if your partner has more money than you, you're going to be in more trouble too. Yeah, that's so true. As I have seen it, especially in partnerships, it feels like it's just as much of a divorce as like a divorce. Oh, maybe even more so. Yeah. Um, Yeah. 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 And you know what? Unfortunately, I I used to say this, if you want justice, you got to get a gun. Like it does just doesn't work like that. Like if you have the money to spend and you can waste it and the other guy doesn't, you're going to leverage him, even if you're wrong. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't work that way. So you want, so you want things in agreements. You want things in agreements like non-disparagement clauses. So, so the person doesn't go out and say all bad things about you. Yeah. I was gonna say, what is that? What's a non-disparagement clause? It's, it's a clause that says whether we're together or we're not together, you can't go and say bad things about me or our company. And if you are, it's a breach of the agreement. You can, you know, go after them for libel and slander and things like that. So it yeah. at least makes them think twice about it. You know, without it, you can say whatever. I actually had a client. We were settling something. This is years ago. And the client calls me and says, I was reading this thing. You mean I can't say anything bad about this person afterward? I'm like, yeah, that's what a settlement is. You know, <laughs> I was like, yeah, no, you can go and say all bad things after, you know, after they paid you money or whatever it was. So it was pretty funny. But um, yeah, I mean, as the lawyer for clients, I make sure that those uh, con, you know, those things are, are in there. Usually people do homegrown contracts. They have all the good stuff. Like if we're getting along, this is how life is going to be. They have nothing about what happens if we get into an argument. How do we settle that dispute? Should it be arbitration and mediation before we go to court, which tends to be cheaper, private, you know, things like that. And if you don't have that writing, good luck, you know, so. Very interesting. So, so interesting. Um, I would love to hear Like, do you have a great story? Uh, without of without course telling confidentiality confident yeah which i yeah. so this is so it's fun to talk to an attorney my husband's an attorney so yeah. like sometimes like it always makes me laugh because he looks at my contracts right he's like checking and and, yeah, of course. and yeah. once in a while he'll just like he gets you guys i think attorneys they just get into the details of things like because that's what your job is right to make yeah. sure everything and he'll just get into the details of things i'm just like i just don't care because right. i think as a business owner or him. as a designer you're like i just don't care. Right. Um, and do you run into that a lot? Yeah. I mean, look, you're going to care if there's a problem. Yes. But you don't care at the beginning. No. And then they, you know what they do? Somebody tells them you really ought to have a partnership agreement. So they go online, they find some crappy agreement, they put it in writing, they think they're covered. You know, it's like getting basic insurance. Well, we have insurance. You know, a junkie agreement is a junkie agreement. So, yeah. I mean, look, it's the other side of the brain. They don't want to deal with They don't want to deal with the finances. They don't want to deal with the written, the contracts and things like that. But it's always the, it's always the creative person, the person that's creating their own work that comes to me and says, this person is trying to steal what I made. What do I do? And I don't have a good answer for them if, if they haven't protected themselves from the beginning. I mean, sure, you find a good attorney, you trust them, whatever, but you still should kind of know 
what's in your agreement. Have it explained to you once, like your will, right? So you have your will explained to you one time. It's great. You sign, you put it away and don't talk about death anymore. Right. But you know that it's, that it's done. And that's where the problems, that's where the problems come from. They come from misunderstandings. Let's assume that everybody is well-intended, which we know is not the case, but let's, let's assume they're all well-intended, right? There are more misunderstandings. Part of the book, I think it's in chapter, let me think, is about memory, right? So I did a chapter, I, I interviewed, I think maybe it was in the first or second chapter. I interviewed a guy, it's a sidebar, one of the chapters, who was a memory expert. He goes and speaks to groups. I've seen him speak about, you know, you've seen like Kevin Trudeau and those guys where they go and, right, he can name, this guy can do it. He can name 100 people's names in the room after he meets them. And, you know, he's, he's one of these guys. And he has a whole system how to prove your memory. So we were talking about how accurate our memories are and you can train them to be better with things when you meet people at a cocktail party whatever but long term our minds are like these boxes with sticky notes and the sticky notes are stuck to the wrong things and you know i, I guarantee that wherever you thought you were 9 11 and where i was on 9 11 which is what they consider to be a flashbulb moment these moments in life when when the challenger blew up or whatever happens in our life whatever you're thinking it's not completely accurate Right. So as a result of that, your well-intended partner and you will remember things differently. And they're probably neither of them are completely accurate. Right. They would say you get two people in the room, you get three, three opinions. And that's what happens. So it's important when you do know what you said and you write it down at the beginning and say, this is what we agreed to, that if we split up, I get to take my designs. These are mine. You could take your and life can go on and OK, it didn't work out. So what? as opposed to arguing about everything, that you, you, you recognize that you're not going to remember everything correctly. It's just not going to happen. And that happens all the time with, I get cases that are blown up because of that, because they're like, well, I have text messages. And this guy said, I'm like, good luck, you know, and it's hard. That's so interesting. So it, I, it's funny because when we started the design suite program, we had several people come with partners mm -hmm. and they said, I, we want to do your design program together. And I said, nope. We yeah, don't do that. Idea. Right. We teach. Well, and there's a couple of things wrong with that. I've only been in one partnership ever, very little business that lasted six months. Right. Yeah. And um, the thing I learned from that is there is always one person who does more than the other. Yeah. There, always. Just the and, natural. It's, it's, not, natural it's not the fault of the person who does less. They just right. literally don't even know that they are doing less. Right. Usually. That's yeah. what, what you kind of see. And so once the more I got into this, the more I was just like the same in design world, like there's usually one person who's actually doing the design work. There's one person who's thinking about it and maybe producing a little bit. And there's also a talent factor. There's always one person that tends to be a little more talented and a little more driven. Right. And so we, we treat everyone like they're, we don't take businesses. We take right. people. Well, you don't go to college together. Exactly. You don't sign and a so will together because you're not going to die together. You can't do that. Yep. You got to do it on your own. You're an individual. And so I think for those of you who are currently in partnerships, and I know there are several of you who are, uh, I recently talked to some, like a group, like a couple of people who were like, one person actually made the physical goods and one person did the marketing and stuff. And I was like, I how do you guys break your ties? And I was, they were like, well, we don't, we, uh, yeah, we just kind of talk about it. And I'm yeah. like, guys, one of you should be in charge and one of you should be working for the other person because that's how you break the ties because one right. person is actually in charge. That's why you and need an agreement that says these are the rules this is what we do. If we break it, do we have a tie? This is who decides. I think yeah. the most successful partners I've seen partnerships is when somebody's really good on the inside stuff. The running the business, the creatives, whatever, and somebody's really good on the outside stuff, the business development, dealing with the salespeople, dealing with the customers, and there's a balance there. It's very common in the family-owned space where you find children that have taken over businesses from parents, and there's a big, big discrepancy between the level of work ethic because maybe one of them's a little bit older and he took over the business. He's the president now. And the other guys, the other kid's the vice president, but he's only doing 20% of the work, but they're both getting the same salary and there's a lot of animosity and nothing in writing. So what are you going to do? You're going to go to your brother and say, Hey, listen, let's do an agreement where I get 80% of the work. And he's like, why would I do that? You know? So, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of that because it, like you said, accidental, they just kind of grew into the business, Yeah, but it's Very gotta be done. It's got to be done. I'm doing it right now for a couple of families, next generation, they're taking over. And I said, listen, you're, you're, you know, your father and your, and your, your two dads had 
and one of them had passed away in one in actually two of the cases he, he had some paper some of the paperwork is in place wasn't all of in place i said listen we're going to do a shareholders agreement for you guys who tell me who does what let's figure all that stuff out and then we're going to do an agreement like you have families so what happens if someone passes away or is done with this they don't want to work anymore or they get they get you know disabled or they can't physically do it or mentally do it or whatever got to have that stuff in writing so you know, because you're dealing with a lot of personalities, you're dealing with spouses, you're dealing with children, and and it's uh, it gets very very complicated very quickly. Yeah, so yeah. fascinating, Kate. Guys, if you are interested in the book, where can they find this? It's on Amazon. Just do a search for Ten Ways to Get Sued." They'll find it. Uh, there's a Kindle I version. I love believe. it every time you say it. Ten <laughs> ways to get yeah, sued. It's pretty funny. So I think there's a Kindle version, but. I don't know if they've connected the two yet. So you can, do, and we're working on an audible version too. We're going to be meeting with somebody in a couple of weeks. So I we'll love see. it. It's a good, it's a good resource book. It's not like read in the bathroom type of book. You know? yeah. yeah. Okay. I love it. Awesome. Um, anywhere else you'd love to send people if they want to know more about what you do. Yeah. They can always go to my website, bindhackerlaw.com. Uh, make sure you spell my last name right, like on the bottom of the screen there. Yeah. And my personal site, MitchBeinhacker.com, is you know the podcast, speaking, books. The book is actually there's a link to the Amazon book on that site as well. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, and LinkedIn is probably the best way to connect with me. But Facebook too. You know, I probably have a Pinterest account, but I don't use it. Instagram, the podcast goes up on Instagram. I don't know. It's all kind That's, of audience. You're like literally the opposite of us. I'm like, oh, the LinkedIn account is not it's, my yeah, favorite. Yeah, because business is LinkedIn, right. Of course. Of course not. Yeah. It's pretty It's pretty yeah. funny. Um, I love it. We're, you guys, we're going to put that in the show notes for you um, if you're interested in that. And then also go maybe check out his podcast and go see what he's talking about with other business owners. All of you are accidental entrepreneurs, whether you like it or not. Right. And I think it's a really good place to start to kind of hear the stories of people and what they're doing. Um, any last advice for any creative out there that is kind of dealing with, you know, any kind of little legal issue? What would you suggest? Get get it in writing. Get it in writing. Learn to be a person who has contracts and protects what they have. That's the one problem that creatives call me about. Somebody's trying to steal their stuff and they don't have it in writing. And I can't do a lot for them, you know? Yeah. Amazing. All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you soon.